This is a short video about uh, section 3.4.2 in Stein's number theory book. And our goal here is to attack the RSA crypto system. And this particular attack works whenever P and Q, which are the prime factors of N, whenever these P's, these two primes P and Q are uh, close to each other. And what we'll look at is what's called the Fermat factorization method. So remember our assumptions here that N factors is a product of two primes, P and Q. Typically P and Q are chosen to be very, very large in real life. Let's also make the assumption that P is bigger than what Q is. And so here's something to notice, and then you can look at the formula down there. But uh, notice a slick weighter IP would be P plus Q. I think this marker is a little bit too big. Hold on one second. There, perfect. P is the same thing as p plus q divided by 2 plus p minus q divided by 2. Think about if you add those fractions together, the q's would cancel. You'd have 2p over 2, which is p. Similarly, q is equal to p plus q over 2 minus p minus q over 2. Think about if you add those fractions together, the p's would cancel, and you'd have positive q, so 2q over 2, which is q. Now the point is, what does PQ look like? Well, that's N, and that would be if you multiplied both of these together. And if you do that, uh, what do you get? You would get, uh, I'll just write it out, P plus Q over two plus P minus Q over two, um, and then that times P plus Q over two minus P minus Q over two. And what I hope that you notice is that that is uh, like factoring a difference of squares. So that should be like a squared minus b squared. So in particular, what do we arrive at? I'm just trying to show you maybe, where does this formula come from here? What we're gonna do is we're gonna name each of these pieces here. We're gonna call S, this guy, P minus Q over two. And something to notice, and, and maybe I'll just say here too, we'll call T, the other one, P plus Q over two. So I'm saying that I'm writing N as N is equal to T squared minus S squared. Now, some, um, some things we want to notice about S and T. So if we assume that P and Q are close to each other, and, and we're not going to write down like a precise notion of what it means to be close, but when they're numbers that are close to each other, well, then this difference here would be pretty small. So it would be this pretty small difference divided by 2. So S is a fairly small number. So now think about uh, what does this say. Maybe it's helpful to you if I clean some of this up a little bit. So I'm going to erase where this Fermat factorization kind of comes from. And now I'm gonna write down what's going on. This number S is small, and just so we're all clear, remember this says that N is equal to T squared minus S squared. And so now what I'll do is, uh, well, if I'm subtracting this positive number S, and if S is small, then this would be less than or equal to just T squared on its own. So now if I take the square root of both sides of this, that says root N is less than or equal to, well, T. And so what am I trying to get at here? The point is, is that if P and Q are close to each other, I'll always have the T is bigger than the square root of N, but when P and Q are close, it's only slightly bigger than the square root of N. So it makes sense where that comes from. And then now there's one last thing to notice. I can rearrange uh, my equation here. N is equal to T squared minus S squared. We could solve that for S squared, uh, which tells me that's t squared minus n equals s squared, that's a perfect square. So what have I got so far? I've got that t itself is only a little bit bigger than the square root of n, and that's this difference here, t squared minus n is a perfect square. That gives me something to start playing with. What we're gonna do is we'll take t to be the ceiling of the square root of n. So this notation here is the ceiling function, and remember what that is, and it says right here, the ceiling of x, what that is, it's, it's the least integer that's above x. So like the ceiling of 1.9 should be 2. That's the smallest integer that is bigger than x. So if x is 1.9, the ceiling is 2. Maybe it would help if I wrote that down. Uh, ceiling 1.9 equals 2. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're just going to play a guessing game with t. And we're going to start with t equals the square root of n, and we'll plug that in to our equation here and see if we get a perfect square. And if we don't, then the next step is just increment t. We'll just keep adding 1. And we just repeat that process until t squared minus n comes out to be a perfect square. 
Now, why is that cool? Because what we'll do is we will take this system of two equations, think of that as a system of equations and the variables P and Q, and what we'll try to do is we'll try to solve them for P and Q. In other words, I'm gonna rewrite it and transform it so that uh, the variables are say S and T. If you solve that system for P and Q, the solution should be P is T plus S, and Q is T minus S. So in other words, if I can find an S and a T that make all this good stuff work, that makes T squared minus N a perfect square, well then I've recovered how to factor N. And remember, as far as RSA is concerned, if you can factor N, which is P times Q, if you could recover those prime factors P and Q, then you could just totally um, infiltrate the crypto system. And maybe what I mean by that is you could decode anything. You could decode any encrypted message. So we could do an example by hand, and then I'll try to show you how to do this stuff in Sage. And again, following what's going on in Stein's number theory, but pretty closely on page 63. So for this example though, here's this N right here, and it's not too big of a number. Um, if we take the square root of N, it's something like this, 1528422.88, et cetera. And what we'll look at then is, we will look at the ceiling of this. So the ceiling of that would be, I would round this up to just four, three at the end. So that's the first one we'll look at. And notice here, that's the first one I start with. That's the ceiling of the square root of N. And then all I'm checking now is when I take the, maybe how I should say this here. Let me scroll back up one second here. T squared minus N is a perfect, is a perfect square S. That's the same thing as saying that the square root of T squared minus N is an integer. And so if you notice how we're looking at this example, we're gonna keep iterating through this process until I actually run into the first time that the square root of t squared minus n is an integer. So that's an equivalent way to say um, what we said on the previous page. So in that case, here's my t right here. And uh, what else do I see? Well, t squared minus n, the square root of that would be s. So I've got my t and my s. So remember, once you have t and once you have s, you add them together to get p and you take t minus s to get q, and therefore you factored that n. Now let's take a look at how we can try to make Sage do some of the work for us here, and we'll put this code into Notability too. Um, not Notability, uh, CoCalc, goodness. I'm using Notability to write all this stuff down. But uh, what we'll do is we'll say um, define, I'll call it the same thing the book does, crack when pq are close, and the function, it's gonna have variable n. So we're defining this function in Sage. And let's say t is the following integer. So I wanna make sure t is an integer, but what do we do? Sage has the ceiling function built in. It's just C-E-I-L. It's also got the square root function built in. So I'm gonna take the ceiling of the square root of n, and I'm just gonna tell the computer to consider that as an integer instead of like a floating point with like a decimal at the end. So I don't want 1.0. Sage doesn't consider that as an integer. It only considers one as an integer. So it, even if it's like zero after a decimal, it's a different type of number as far as the computer's concerned. So we're just trying to take care of that. And now what we'll do is we'll write this, uh, this while loop here that will do all of the incrementing and stuff for us. So while true, uh, I'm gonna set k to be equal to t squared minus n. And then if k is bigger than zero, here's what I want it to always do. I'm gonna tell you what s is. s should be the integer, so integer. And then what I'll do is again, I'll make an integer out of the following rounded number. So round square roots, SQRT of, of K, basically. So I'll just put K in there. So I am simplifying a little bit of what the book does if you're following along with that. That is just what we defined K to be. And the next thing I wanna do is, now that I've got an S, remember I wanted to check, like um, is, is S um, equal to the square root of T squared minus N? So the way I'll write that is if S squared uh, plus N is the same thing as what t squared is, then I'm done. I'll return uh, p, which is t plus s, or s plus t, whatever you want to say, and q would be t minus s. And, and uh, other than that though, if that's not the case, if that condition's not met, then that's where I'm gonna back up here, and I'm just gonna go t plus equals one. And so that'll add one to, again, the floor of the square root of n. And every time that the condition and the if statements are not met, then you will just increment and repeat, is what this does. Um, maybe there's one last thing that I wanted to do here. Um, I think just so you could see what's going on, I wanted to say something like, uh, you know, print 
um, k equals k. Um, what else do I want to do? Just so you see them, um, I'll do t equals t. And then finally, uh, s equals comma s, just so we see how they're working. All right, so let's try to run this and see if it works. Fingers crossed it does. So if I want to call it crack when pq close, and let's just pick something random, like we're not super random, kind of small. Let's say 77, right? I know the answer should be seven times 11. Let's make sure my function crack when pq close uh, captures that. So. So right, when we take the square root of 77, um, I see that the ceiling of that is nine, so that's where that first t comes from, and that happens to be just the first one that works. So in other words, that happened. The, the first one we tried happens to be the one that works, is what I mean to say. Um, I could do another one, so let's define also, let's play around one more time, crack when pq, close, and let's just kind of reverse engineer this a little bit. What if I did something like um, 90, 93 times 151. I think those are both prime. All right, cool. So you see that um, I run through this process and it ran through four times and recovered at the end. T was 122 and S was 29. And so what we should do to get P, I should take 122 plus 29. Well, that's 151, surprise. And to get Q, uh, you'll take 122 minus 29. And of course, that's 93. So just like we expected, I expected this to just return the factorization of 93 times 5, 151, and it does.